Perfect. Okay. So, um, so uh, this is going to be somewhat short. We're going to try to go until what? What did the schedule go to? Is it um, nine forty-five? Okay. So, um, uh, I, um, this is mostly just to get us ourselves warmed up um, and talk a little bit about uh, C plus plus classes. Is where we're going to try to. Um, we're going to try to talk about uh, C++ classes and uh, some of the syntax about them and why they're going to be used. And we're going to do this in the context of trying to build abstract complex uh, systems. Um, so uh, take this as sort of like a parable of how we're going to um, like go about designing computer software. Um, so right. So. Uh, could think of, of trying to um, model a large complex system. Um, when we model proteins, we look at all the detailed uh, small interactions of like docking ligands on proteins to know about all the atoms and, and at the positions of where they are. But when we're looking at, say, a full organism, that's way too much information to understand how it works. So if we can encapsulate that information into just, say, like a KD, or like if it's uh, activating the molecule or inhibiting the interaction, um, then we can represent the information um, in, a, in a much more um, compact way. So that way we can, we can look at, at a broader scale what's going on. So the, uh, the reason why I'm mentioning this is that when we're writing code for Rosetta, we have lots of code. And so if we had to look at the details of each class or each uh, piece of, of, of code that everybody else wrote, it would be too overwhelming. So if we can try to uh, write code in such a way that it abstracts well, so we can get it at a higher level view of what's going on, then we have a chance of trying to actually use it effectively. Um, so in the same way that we can build up stuff with like Lego pieces, what we'd like is to be able to have the Lego pieces work in ways that we uh, interpret would like them to work. So um, if, if you could build a Lego so that way it goes up and then connects back down to the bottom, it would be very confusing to understand how Lego uh, towers fit together. So uh, if we can build our components in such a way that they behave like you would expect them to, then, um, then they're much easier to work with in the long run. So uh, like, uh, the, um, the, the way that I have to think of this is uh, when you go out into the world and you look at design of, of, um, of things that have been engineered, think of how you interact with them and whether they've been engineered effectively. Like if you see a doorknob, it's very clear of what you should do with it. You should just open the door. You can reach it and pull it. But whenever I look at a microwave, all of the, interac all of the buttons are different on every microwave that I've ever seen, and I have no idea why. But it, so if you, if you, can, it, like, if you just want to turn on the microwave um, and you don't know how to use all the buttons, then it makes it very difficult to, to use it, and you have to figure out, you have to fiddle with it for a while. So um, when you're designing software, think about who is going to be using it and what is going to be the natural way to interact with it. And it's, um, I think it just takes a common sense. And if you have, um, it's sort of like de designing a piece of art of like how, how is the, the person who's going to interact with it experience working with this thing. Um, so if it behaves naturally, or you have some sort of idea of, of how it's supposed to work, then um, it's easier to communicate how that is going to work um, rather than all of the details in sort of a haphazard way. So like, for instance, if you had a microwave, um, rather than having a million buttons, if it just had a twist of like turn on and then it would just turn off, it would be very intuitive to use. So uh, when you're designing software, think about as a, like the interface or the outside part of it. How is the, the user going to come in and interact with it? And um, if you can separate sort of the inside of the details of how it works, so that way the outside is, is a natural, um, very uh, consistent interface that doesn't have uh, um, inconsistencies eventually how it used, then, uh, then it will go a long way to making sure that, that it can become a Lego part that can fit into a, a larger component of, um, of software. Um, OK, so I, um, we'll talk a little bit about some of the abstractions that we're not going to talk about. But, um, but think of, of when you program in computers that, that there's going to be um, like a whole set of abstractions that, we're, that we can sort of assume that are, are taking place. So um, to me, like the most essential part of what makes computers work is this idea of, of how nonlinear behavior can turn into digital logic. Um, so this is a, not a computer. This is a titration curve from chemistry. But this is sort of the classic nonlinear behavior, where it's 
it's sort of in this regime here, and then as soon as you hit uh, 15 um, milliliters, then, then it suddenly transforms into something else. So in electronics, they figured out how to do this with a resistor or a transistor. And, and this is um, it, by having lots of these interactions um, in the trillions or, um, that they're able to create computers that have states of being in one state or another. Um, it seems like there's, uh, computers are, are, are doing erratic things, but under the, eventually, um, if the abstractions hold, they're in one particular state and they're going to do a very specific thing. So uh, if you can think about how computers are going to be are implementing this abstraction of, of being like uh, either in this state or this state, under, under the hood it's, it's going to be kind of messy nonlinear system, but it's trying to implement an abstraction in the same way that, uh, that, um, that the model of the proteins or the model of, of anything else is going to Im implement an abstraction. So um, uh, if this is sort of the nonlinear curve for, for, um, uh, for the power of, of, say, a transistor, if you put trillions of them together, you can get uh, um, these CPUs that are built up with memory and, and, and function as, as computers. Um, an interesting thought is that the nonlinearity in, in brains, um, although it's a different process and there's different things going on, that this nonlinearity is, is central in trying to make specific behavior happen in the brains as well. So um, there's sort of an interesting connection there. Um, OK, so the, the, the building up the layers of abstraction. Yeah, 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 yeah please. Throwing one plug for neuroscience there. Uh, yeah, so there's, there's the nonlinearity at the level of uh, like action potential, but also at every level of organization in the brain, at the level of the synapse, at the level of the circuit, and then also at the level of the um, of like whole regions of oh, wow. anatomical areas. So there's nonlinearity operating on top of more nonlinearity. So that's how you sort of get the function out of it at the yeah, end of the day. Yeah, so you get function out of some yeah. combination of all of these. Wow. Very cool. OK. Um, so, uh, so with the transistor, which has either being one state or another, um, from this you can build up digital logic gates, which, have, um, which implement um, uh, in sort of a mathematical way whether it's going to be, if you have two variables coming in, that they have one variable coming out. Um, so this is a function. It's either and or not or or. Um, and from these logic gates, they can build up instruction sets of more complex behavior. And from the instruction sets, you can build up into programming languages. So we're going to be primarily focused on looking at how do you write software for programming languages that turn into applications. But underneath all this are these layers of abstraction that, that encode all, uh, this different functionality. So uh, in thinking about designing systems think about trying to interact with a system that has been engineered to have a specific interface and it's going to work the way they tell you it's going to work and that what you're going to build is going to be another layer on this abstraction and it's going to have some functionality so we're sort of um, in engineering your the the applications and the different uh, parts say for Zeta uh, we're going to try to build on on these abstractions and make new abstractions um, to, uh, to encapsulate uh, functionality that's going to do specific things. Um, so we're going to get lots of examples of these themes going throughout the week, but I just want to introduce them here in the beginning. Um, so uh, to sort of build our way up in the, in the programming language, um, a natural uh, abstraction that we have is, is an int in, in C++. And so this captures what we conceptually have in, in math is, um, say, like the integers. So it has positive and negative numbers, and they, they behave the way you should, or you would expect them to. Um, since integers are infinite and computers are not, this abstraction breaks down in that they can have integer overflow. So there's um, a certain size of numbers that can be represented with an integer, and it can get bigger than that. So understanding sort of the limitations of the abstractions and what they can and can't do um, is, is important in understanding how to work with systems. So, in, when you're designing systems that are going to have abstractions, there's going to be ways that it's going to break down. But having it break down in sort of reasonable ways and being able to understand. Um, so you can tell your users, like, as long as you have numbers that are smaller than this, that it'll work. And if you have, it'll behave like an integer. But if you have numbers that are bigger than this, then it's going to have this other behavior. So um, trying to be aware of the limitations of the abstractions and, and when it makes sense and when it doesn't. So in a similar way, we have a, a float, which um, is represents, say, a, a, like a real number. So you could think of a number on the number line 
as just being a position on this line here. Um, but in, in real numbers, uh, you can have pi and the square root of 3 and rational numbers. But and since you can't represent uh, pi as a rational number because it has infinite number of digits in, in a binary expansion, uh, there's this representation for um, uh, rational numbers, which is um, called uh, the float, or it's the IEEE float specification. So we don't have to um, just know that there is this representation for when you represent a floating point number, which is called like a real um, in, um, in Rosetta, which is, is um, it's, um, not just a single precision, but it's going to be double precision. But in any sense, um, for a float, it has, um, there's a fractional part, and then there's an exponent part, and then a sign. Um, but it has a certain number of bits that it represents, and it can overflow in the same way that the integers can overflow. So understanding um, uh, how the numeric precision of the numbers is going to be effective um, in, when you write programs is, is, um, is, is going to be important. And um, I hope Jack is going to come back and talk about numeric precision and how to write geometric algorithms um, that, that uh, deal with some of these issues of, of, um, of overflowing precision on Friday. Um, OK, so um, uh, I'm going to work up my way up to talking about classes and objects. Um, but an important idea to start with is, is what is a variable in C++. And in my eyes, the, the important part of a variable is that it has a particular type. It has some sort of, um, you can say what it is, and it also has state. It, uh, it's a specific uh, value at the time. So um, in this case, I have my int, which is going to be an int, and I'm going to assign it a value of 7. So the int has this particular state. I'm going to say it's 7. Um, and then in um, my int, I'm going to uh, define um, uh, your float um, from it. So there's going to be some conversion of representation from an integer to a float. And I've put this in scope, so it has like a particular limitation of it's defined in this particular space, and it has a particular uh, type. It's going to be, um, you can think of it as a float. Um, so as we, as we make complex systems, making things that have a particular type in a particular state are going to be important to represent, uh, to do the modeling that we want to do. So this is, um, uh, even though this is very simple, thinking of, OK, when I have an, a, a variable, how is it? How am I supposed to interact with it? Like this has, um, like if I, I know that since it's a variable, I can assign something to it, and since I, it's a variable, I can get something from it. I can get its value out. So thinking of, of a variable as having this particular interface, it, it allows you to do these specific things. Um, these variables are are built into the language, but we're going to be trying to develop our own types of variables that are going to have their own sets of behaviors to them. So being very clear about what are the behaviors that you allow it to have and what are the behaviors that you don't allow it to have and when does that break down and, and, um, and is going to be important to making sure that people can use your code in ways that are effective. So uh, another key part of, of, um, in programming languages is this idea of a function. So rather than just having a state and a, um, and a type, a function has, um, it's a process. So you give it inputs and out, it has outputs to it. Um, this represents in math a uh, mathematical function. So there's some um, uh, like process, like it's like a machine. It, it comes in with something and it goes out with something. And so if you can define what are the things that it takes in and what are the things that it produces, then they don't actually need to understand what's inside of the function, um, which is a way of encapsulating behavior. Uh, so um, in C++, um, it's uh, to define them. You have the function name, and then here are the the variables that come in, and then here is the type of thing that's coming out. Um, so, in this case, I have an example of it's a minimum ceiling. So this takes two floating values and returns the integer that's uh, that's bigger than both of them, but the smallest integer that does that. So this has a very specific behavior to it. It has two things coming in that are float uh, of of type float, and it has one thing coming out that's of type int. Um, and so uh, this is th the behavior that it has. It has um, some specific um, number of, of, of steps that it goes through to compute the result that comes out. Um, but the important part is that when you're looking at a, a function, that it has some, um, some name to it, and it knows what's going to come in and what's going to come out of it. And um, 
once you are from the outside, that should be what's important of what's containing a function. And then when you're inside of the function, you don't need to know about anything else about how it's being used. All that you need to know about is, is um, looking at, at this particular part. So this is sort of a barrier or a separation of responsibility from the outside world and the inside world. And what I hope is that you'll see that when you go in and look at a function in the code, you can look at its signature, which is how this part is defined. And from that, you can determine what is the behavior. Um, you don't need to know about who's going to be calling it or in what context it's going to work. And all, and, uh, all that you need to know about in order to understand how the function works is, is uh, what sort of the contract that it's making to somebody who's going to be calling the function. OK, so uh, we have this idea of a state and a variable and a function and a process. Um, uh, so if we have a sewing machine, is this a variable or a function? And in some ways, it's both, right? So uh, uh, in, um, in as far as state goes, um, it has like the needle position. It has a particular stitch type. It has the position of the thread. It has um, what color thread it, it's got. Um, so it has all these different properties, which you could think of as having particular type and particular state. But it also has a function, which is that if you give it cloth, it stitches the cloth and gives you back cloth. So to sort of combine these two ideas into a, to model a thing like a sewing machine, um, one of the ways to do this is through like a class or through an object-oriented programming. So uh, as an example, if we wanted to create a class that modeled a sewing machine, we would have a public interface for the things that it, it uh, defines. And then it has the private, usually is the state that's, uh, that it maintains that you can access through the public interface. So in this case, uh, this is a, a constructor. So this, um, sorry, this is a function called sew, which it, you give it a cloth C, and it ends up with stitched cloth. So this is um, uh, the, the main function that it has. And then it also allows you to change the thread. So since sewing machines don't really let you adjust the needle position, it's not part of the public interface of how to interact with a sewing machine. It's, um, it's hidden as this private, private member variables. And what's nice is that if you want to interact with a sewing machine, all you need to know is that you can change the thread and you can uh, sew the cloth. You don't need to necessarily know all the details of all the mechanical workings of it. So this idea of, of extracting the, the, um, the thread and all of the details are, are contained as these member variables. So um, a particular uh, class defines the public interface and the private member variables. And then from this, um, we create instances of the class. So we sort of have a blueprint for what a sewing machine consists of. And when we actually want a sewing machine, then that's defined. Then we actually get um, like uh, a particular like the sewing machine is defining the type. And then we get a particular sewing machine. It has a particular instant, a state of, of where the variables are. So what is the actual thread? How is the needle position? And so on. Okay. Um, so the idea is we have a class, and then from that we're going to instantiate instances of the class and use them. So the class is sort of this blueprint, and the, and the objects are going to be um, instances of the, of the class. Um, so um, here is sort of the C++ uh, syntax of how you would define um, a sewing machine and then use it. So um, this is in the same way that we had my int is going to be an int, we're going to say the singer is going to be um, an instance of the sewing machine variable. And um, we're going to define um, uh, another um, class. We'll call this one thread. And this one may have, um, rather than, than just to saying thread and then the type, um, this is called using a constructor, where it has um, variables that are coming in um, that, that create the state in a particular way. So uh, we've now got two instances. We've got a singer and a thread. And uh, we're going to call a member function on the singer. So for this particular instance of this class, we're going to change the thread. So this is the function that we defined, that we had uh, in the class. And we're going to pass in thread to it. And it's going to change the state of the, of the, uh, of, um, of the sewing machine. Um, yes? So this is um, a function that takes in three arguments. Uh -huh. So um, in the same way that we can define functions, 
a constructor is a special type of function that is called when the instance of that object is created. I just don't understand what the value is. If we did singer dot red or singer dot get thread type, I don't understand what value it would return. Um, yeah, so um, it would return a thread object, it, not necessarily like uh, one of these guys here. So oh. it can return, so since like in, in lady of a function as an input and output, if you said get thread, it would return a thread object. Not all of the details of what the threads are. You know. So in that sense, we've abstracted away from the color, the type, you know, whether it's um, a full bobbin or not, to just thinking of it as like a thread object. Oh, oh I see. OK. Those that, weren't three different types of threads. Those were three characters. Exactly. Oh. Yeah. Does that make sense? OK. Um, right, so then if we have cloth, which would be another um, instance of another class, we could uh, create a stitched cloth which is uh, we'll call a garment. And so we're going to take the cloth and call the sew function on the, on the singer. And that's going to return a garment. Uh, it's going to return a stitched cloth, which we're going to define as a garment. Does, that, does this syntax make sense? I'm going to get into constructors uh, um, in the next slide. Do you have a garment function somewhere? Yeah, so the, the syntax um, for a constructor oh, okay. is um, you call the function um, when uh, you're defining the instance of it. So in this case, um, the thread took in these three variables in the constructor, but the garment uh, or the stitch cloth is going to take in, um, it's going to take in an instance of a stitch cloth. So we're, we're constructing a new garment from, from what this, this is going to return. Right, yeah. So it's um, generic it's definition. Generic, yeah. Okay. yeah. So this is going to be like a default constructor. This is going to be a, a specific constructor. And this is going to be a copy constructor. Um, OK. So uh, how we would implement this in the class is um, uh, in the class definition, we define a function, except in the function um, if we take uh, no arguments, and this name here is the same as the class, then this is just a special function that's going to be called when the instance of the object is created. And it's called the default constructor. And whether you define a default constructor or not, uh, the so if you don't define a default constructor, then C++ is going to make one for you um, behind the scenes. So um, it's generally a reasonable idea to create your own default constructor that's going to have its own um, behavior that's going to do what you want it to do. OK, so um, to, um, to implement a function for a class, uh, it, um, we've separated out the interface from the class. So this is, um, it's say, class, and then the name of the class. And then um, in curly braces, we have, um, like we had before, uh, um, just the, the signature for, for each of the functions. And if we wanted to define member variables, we could do that. Um, uh, generally, what's the right way to do this is, is then outside of the class definition, we have, um, uh, we're going to define a function. So this is uh, in the same way that, that we had the, um, the minimum ceiling, except um, uh, we're going to say this is um, uh, the name of the class here with these two dots is, is um, puts it into the context of, of this class. So this is the complete name of this function, is the name of the class and then the name of the function. And so what we're going to do is define this function, which we have here. And, it's, um, and this is, uh, um, it doesn't return anything. Uh, uh, instead, what we have is this uh, constructor argument list. Um, so we had all of the member variables. And since the member variables need to be constructed, um, the syntax is you put a colon and then uh, this list with commas coming after it, which um, are going to initialize the member variables. And um, so this gives us a way to, to set the variables to begin with, and then whether or not we wanted to actually implement any behavior in the body of the function, we could. Um, um, is this making sense? People have um, seen this before. Maybe this is OK. But if you haven't, um, ask questions if, it, if it's not making any sense. So, um, uh, so when something goes uh, out of scope, so like for instance at the end of a function, 
or at the end of uh, curly braces, it's automatically destructed if it was created on um, just like we've been making variables. Um, we'll talk more about memory management, I guess, later this afternoon. And uh, there you'll see that it's possible to create an object on the heap, which is you, you create an object that can live beyond the definition of a function. And if you don't ever um, uh, destruct that, then it will just live until your program exits. So um, in raw C++, um, it, there's a keyword called delete, which you call delete on the variable, and it clears up the memory. Um, in Rosetta, it's easy to forget how to delete an object. Um, so the destructor, um, we have a way, thing called um, owning pointers, which keep track of this. And we'll, we'll get into this more. You're, you'll talk about owning pointers. OK. So um, we'll talk about this um, when the, the destructor is called. But basically, it's called um, when the last person or the last handle of it is, is, um, is freed up. But is it something that you have to do? Because I did all this time to find it out. Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, uh, for the, what we were doing, if, uh, since the programs were so short, you wouldn't notice if, the, if we had memory leaks. Yeah, I noticed. But, um, but uh, in Rosetta, we don't have to do that because we have this idea of an owning pointer. Do you have a worm on, oh my gosh. on your shirt collar? Oh, wow. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> He's coming along for the ride. Oh, where'd it go? <laughs> Into your cup? Oh. Oh, that's so interesting. I don't know where this came from. <laughs> It's not I on you anymore. Okay. I don't know where it went, but... Okay, excellent. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Um, yes? Yeah, so default constructors are fine. Um, in some cases, they're, um, they're sort of the standard way of creating something. Um, if you don't want somebody to use the default constructor, there's a trick where you can make the default constructor in the private section of the class. And that way, they'll try to call it, and they go, oh, you can't call that because it's private. So, but, um, but you should, um, uh, and the default constructor will call the default constructor for each of the member variables if you don't define it, which may be what you want. It's fine. But in general, it's good practice to, um, to create a, mem a default constructor that has the behavior that you want it to have. Great question. Um, so a user could never change fish type to something like curly instead of straight? Or so um, these, this is initializing the member variables to have a particular state. Right. But that doesn't mean that it, once the object has been created, that those variables could have different state. Um, they could be changed if you, say, change the thread type. But you didn't provide any methods for that. Right. So I haven't, I haven't implemented that yet, or I haven't shown it here. Um, OK, so the destructor is another special function. Can you actually read that? That's really light color, isn't it? Um, it has a, I don't know if you can see this, but it has a, um, a tilde to begin with. And so the, um, it's just the name of the class with a tilde. And then um, it's, the, it's the same way as the, um, the name of the class, colon, colon, tilde, and the name of this. Um, for the most part, um, there's not much that needs to be done in the destructor. And so there's a good chance you'll never have to write a destructor at least this week. And if you do have to write one, it will be very, very rare. But for completeness, I just want to show you that, that it can be done. Um, OK. Um, right. Uh, so I know that you guys are totally done with FizzBuzz. Um, it was uh, painful. and OK. But um, uh, one thing that, that I, s I saw a number of people do that um, I want to just mention. Um, so for the, the question one, write a class and use it to answer a question 1.1. 1 .1. Um, uh, this is so what I gave you, or what I suggested, was to create a class that had um, this enum type, which is, um, it's, you can think of it as a variable where the values that it can take on are just these named things. So rather than saying like an integer which has 1, 2, 3, um, it, rather than calling them 1, 2, 3, we give them these aliases, which is just um, fizz, buzz, fizz, buzz, and none. Um, but they are under the hood just integers. So this is an abstraction away from integers that we can refer to them in a more natural way. Um, so we have this enum type, and we have, I said we should have these two private uh, variables, number and fizzbuzz state, um, make a class that does something with this. 
And um, so many people are like, OK, I know how to deal with private member variables. We'll make getters and setters so we can set the number and get the number and set the state and get the state. Um, but this is not um, really the, the right thing to do. Um, does that, um, can anybody guess why that would be not good to have just uh, getters and setters for each of these different guys? Yeah, so if you're going to just have getters and setters, you could have them public, but then why wouldn't you want to have your member variables public? Yeah, exactly. So um, so what would be some way that you could uh, for this class in a way that would break sort of the abstraction of what it's supposed to do if you could, um, if you could uh, change one, uh, one of the variables, say? Exactly, yeah. So... So if you set the number and then you set the state to be different than what the number is, so like um, uh, so like if, so this is um, uh, if you have if you set the fizzbuzz state to be nine, then this is generally what you'd like to have it do. You'd say get the fizzbuzz state and it would return um, nine is divisible by three but not by five, so it would return fizz, right? So what happens if you um, uh, if you had you set it to eight? And then you're allowed to say set the fizz state to be fizz buzz, which is, means that it's divisible by both three and five. Then it's gonna, um, it's not gonna return none. It's gonna return fizz buzz because you set it that way. So it, you really don't need to have this set fizz buzz state because it's always determined based on the number that you put in. So you don't need to have a getter and a setter for the fizz buzz state. All you should do is is um, make sure the state is matches the number. So if you just have an interface for the number and the state is sort of extra or private information that's in order to, to keep the encapsulation or keep the, um, the inner workings of the class separate from the outside world, then you have a more natural, more, uh, you can have more affordance so you can do what you expect it to do. So you can't get the, the, the class or the variable to be in, the, in a state that you don't want it to be where it doesn't make any sense. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, yeah, so many people have this uh, set state where they just go through and set the FISBA state, but, it's, um, but it allows you to set it into a, um, uh, to interact with it in ways that's not intuitive, sort of like stacking the Legos into an Escher like drawing. Okay, so um, uh, in this way, um, to, to keep the public and private separate, um, there's these keywords called public colon and private colon, and we'll talk about another one when um, in a minute, um, uh, called protected. But here, the public interface is going to be the um, the enum type, so that way um, the users can get the values at the end of the day, or the the FISBA states. And then um, there's a constructor where, rather than the default constructor, this one takes in a, a number, which is an unsigned int, and from the number, um, we're going to set the state of the of the class. So um, here, we're going to initialize number to be the number that came in, and we're going to set the fizzba state using the set state function. Um, so set state um, is going to uh, um, take in the number, or it's not going to take anything. It's going to use the number and, um, and just simply set the state. Um, so I've messed this up by saying that it's fizz, the set state is going to um, return something, and I said it's going to return void. So instead, this should be in, in the curly braces instead of um, here in the constructor list. And then the, the other public interfaces um, uh, get the fizzbuzz state, and that simply just returns the fizzbuzz state. So in this case, you don't need to actually have a, a set fizzbuzz state because it's set automatically in the constructor. You don't even need to have a set the number state because we're just going to interact with it once it's constructed. So it's um, in this case, once you've set the number, it's set for good, um, which um, uh, in this case, is enough for the functionality that we need. We don't need to have it be dynamically changed. Um, okay, so um, in this case, uh, we didn't implement the default constructor. Um, so it was going to, um, uh, if it did it automatically, then it would just set the, um, the number to be uh, zero, and it would set the fizzbuzz state to be something. Um, perhaps it would be zero. Um, so it's probably good to, to, to define our own default constructor that's going to um, set, set the state um, for 0, which would be, I guess, fizzbuzz. So it's good to initialize the, um, 
the, all of the resources that you need. So in this case, all of the member variables um, to be uh, in the right state uh, at, at all times. So we can think of this as like a, an invariant. Like if we're at any particular point, either in a good state or, or in a, um, we're not in a, in a broken place, and every time we change the state of it to something else, we're also in a good place, then we can guarantee for all time that, that we're not going to break the interface or break the abstraction. So this is sort of like a detailed balance, if you've heard of this, for, um, uh, for um, maintaining uh, reversibility, or thermodynamic reversibility. So if, if you make one move that's not going to compress the state space, then, um, then over time, then you end up with, uh, with a whole simulation. If you haven't heard this, then um, it's OK. Um, OK, so um, I want to give, uh, let's see, how are we doing on time? Oh, I'm out of time. OK. Um, interesting. Um, <laughs> Andrew, if I run over a few minutes, is this? Um, OK, good. So um, uh, polymorphism. OK, so um, the idea is that um, we've been talking about the inside of the code and the outside of the code as being uh, the, uh, um, the abstraction, right? So for polymorphism, the idea is that um, for the outside, um, if we have lots of pieces of code that are doing similar things, then polymorphism is a way to uh, group them together and give them a common interface. So that way the user knows how to interact with a variety of different classes um, in the same way. Um, from uh, the developer's perspective on the inside, then by doing this sort of grouping and, and pulling functionality out uh, and, and, uh, and grouping it, we, can, um, we don't have to duplicate the functionality in each of the, of the similar classes. Um, uh, um, uh, okay, so, so, um, so, one idea, so one aspect of, of, um, of polymorphism is having um, uh, the same function that does um, essentially the same thing to the outside but does different things on the inside. Um, so, uh, um, uh, so if a function takes in different arguments, then it's um, then it, it's called polymorphic in the um, in the function. So it's essentially um, uh, a different function when it's implemented, but you can use it uh, to do the same sort of thing. So a constructor is an example of a polymorphic function in that um, we're calling the same function a constructor, but with different arguments, and then it's implemented with different functions. So it's um, as if we had two separate functions with the same name, but the, com the compiler can figure out which one to call based on the, the, um, the arguments. But you're not talking about like, which type of arguments we're passing. You're actually talking about the number of arguments. Um, so it's, yeah, so it's based on both the type and the number of arguments. So if you had um, one function that took in a string and another that took in an int, then they would be separate functions. Um, if you, um, it can be uh, so, if you had one that was an int and one that was a float, um, then uh, there's these automatic conversion from an int to a float. Um, so, uh, it, there's, so there's some, there's a um, how does this work? There's um. Well, um yeah, in that case, if there's a default constructor for the object that you have, so uh, in the case of uh, primitives. Okay, so I, I was thinking of it in a broader sense, but you're right. This is um, this is uh, okay. So this is not what I uh, what we would traditionally call polymorphism. This is uh, uh, function overloading, which um, um, which is different. Okay. Um, Jack's covering for me, I know. Okay. Um, Can I ask a good question? Yeah. So, can you go back one slide? Yeah, yeah. Yes. If you were then to 
Yeah. And say these are both fizz plugs. Yes, exactly. So that actually seems very confusing to me because you could have, um, like, you, want, you might not remember that like this object has you know, very different behavior depending on mm. how it's constructed. You can be sound, like confused when I have both fizz plugs. Yeah, so, so it's the role of the developer to make sure that, that, that when you've implemented something that could potentially have different functionality depending on how it's constructed, that it has, that you're presenting a consistent interface to the user, right? So you could be devious and make the, the class do different things based on different constructors, but in the service to the user, you would make it do the right thing, whatever that, that may be. Mm. So there's um, through testing, I guess, would be one way to do it. Um, um, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll get back to this in, in more detail and we'll have more context later, I think. Um, okay. Uh, um, okay, so um, this, I think, is what uh, Andrew was talking about as far as class polymorphism. So um, uh, in this case, we have uh, three separate geometric things, um, a point, a line, and a rectangle. And we would want to represent them as, say, three different classes. So the point would have the x and y coordinates and a color. And the line would have the x and y coordinates of either endpoint and the color. And the rectangle would have the x and y coordinates of the, this corner and that corner and the color. And um, if we wanted to implement, say, uh, dealing with the color, setting the color, and getting the color, um, then uh, we could implement that functionality in each of the classes, um, but then we would have code duplication. And if somehow we messed it up, then um, uh, the interface for the user would be slightly different um, um, if they were uh, implemented slightly differently. Um, so if this is the interfaces that we would like to have for these different guys, where we can find the center, we can get the color, and for the line and rectangle, we also have getting the, line, the length and the area of it. So, we ha so there's some special functionality that we would want for these guys. Um, but general, all of them have this function called the center and the color. Um, so in this case, this is a, uh, an example of where we could use class polymorphism to abstract out um, certain parts of, of the functionality in the interface in order to, um, to, to organize the code. Um, so the idea is we're going to create another class called shape, which is going to um, be a base class, and we're going to create three derived classes that are going to derive from shape. Um, so the shape is going to have a member variable called color, and it's going to have a function called center that for any shape, it doesn't matter what type of shape it is, if you call center, you can get the center of the, um, of the shape. And then point is going to have um, uh, uh, the, the, the data to, to represent the center and, and um, how to represent the geometric line. Uh, object are going to be contained um, in the derived classes. And then extra functions like length and area are going to be in those specific classes as well. So this base class and derived class is, is conceptually what we're trying to do. Um, and to do this, uh, this is the syntax for the, base, for the shape, the base class. So we have the public and the private keywords. Um, and so we have color as being a member variable of, of uh, shape. Um, we have a, a constructor for a shape that takes in a color, and we're going to set the color. And uh, so this is the, the new part, which you may not have seen, is um, it, we have a function um, called uh, virtual. So um, what this is, is this uh, function, if we call it on a shape, so either a base class, or sorry, on one of the drive classes, then it, um, if it doesn't um, overload the color function, it will get this version. But if there's a function called color in one of the derived classes, then um, it, will, uh, it will use that version of it and not the base class version. If there's a virtual method that uh, we want to have in the base class is for the interface, but we don't want to implement it in the interface because, say, we can't compute the center for, a, for a, an arbitrary shape without knowing its data, then there is a syntax where it has an equals and then a zero. And what this means is that it's required that the drive class has a function called center uh, that does something. Um, 
in this case it returns void, but um, conceptually what it should do is return the center. So for whatever drive class you have, um, it will compute the center for it. So if you're given a shape, then you should be able to call color, and you should be able to call center on it. Virtual is a keyword, which means that um, uh, that it means that uh, just that it can be derived, it can be implemented in the derived class. Um, there's um, a virtual lookup table that the compiler um, does behind the scenes, which we don't need to know about. Um, but it's uh, it's basically just a, um, a, a keyword that you include in functions in the base class that says to uh, that it can be overrided in the in the derived class. Um, uh, okay, so this is this is the class point, and to say that it is a derived class from shape, is this is the syntax for it. There's a colon, and then it's public shape. So um, what this says is that we're gonna, um, in addition to having shape, we're gonna um, it's gonna be uh, have all of the member variables of shape and all of the functions that shape had. Uh, in addition, we're gonna have these other things. Um, so uh, if we call the constructor, we're going to add a new constructor. And since it, we have the, the shape um, uh, constructor, we can call the constructor on shape as well. Um, it, if we um, overload, uh, since we implement center, um, uh, this is the, um, the function that has the same signature as, as the one in the base class. And so if somebody calls uh, center on, um, on, a, on a point, then it will use this version. Or if we call center on um, a shape and it happens to be a point, then it will call this function as well. Does this make sense? Okay, um, okay so uh, one last concept. Um, in addition to, say, public and private, there's this notion of a protected um, specif access specifier. And what this is is that uh, if this is a base class, and there's a, a member functions or, or variables, um, member variables in the protected, then you can't use it from the outside, but they can be accessed from functions in the drive class. So in a function in the drive class, we can set the protected variable because it's in the protected, but we can't set the private because the private is private to the base class. And then if we were outside of the class, we could only access the public interface, the ones that are in public. So it's sort of halfway in between public and private. Although uh, in your implementing the base class, protected is basically public because anybody can drive from, from your class that they want, and they can do whatever you want with it. So um, they can, they can, um, it's basically a public, but it just limits the interface. Exactly. So uh, there's another way that you can access this by calling a function outside um, with a friend keyword, and that means you can, um, uh, can access the, the, the private variables. Why would you need to do something outside? Why would you need this kind of um, I don't have examples at the tip of my fingers. Um, uh, it, it, in trying to understand, um, uh, like if, if this, the functionality um, in the drive class needs to um, to set some state in the base class um, that's not totally encapsulated within the the, um, the behavior of, of the, in the private. Um, I'm not answering your question, but um, I'm sure we'll come up with examples of this throughout the week. And, um, one thing that uh, we like to avoid is the protected data because it makes it very difficult to um, ensure that uh, the state of the system is consistent for us. But um, one thing that you can Um, and uh, in, uh, for time, I think I don't need to, I'm not going to talk about um, casting and inheritance. Um, 
So I think I'm going to be done for this. Um, and for the schedule, I think we have a short break, but I've already ran over, so we're already behind. Um, uh, but um, we'll get into an activity here soon enough, so it won't just be listening to another lecture. Um,